I'm really excited to be here. This is my first time at Craft and Commerce. It's my first time at a conference in two years. I haven't been traveling much. And uh, so I've been really excited to be here. And normally, I speak to authors. And uh, I love authors. They're amazing people. I am an author. Um, but I usually have to spend like a good portion of my talk just convincing them that they need an email list. <laughs> I'm assuming I don't have to do that here. Uh, so, um, yeah, so I've been really excited about it, and I love authors, like I said, um, but the journey that all of you are on here has been my journey for the last 13 years, and so I've been very nervous about what I'm going to share with you, and uh, it's, it's, I can always tell how much I care about the audience by how nervous I am, so scared to death, so we're good. Um, <laughs> But uh, so I'm going to just share something today that um, I wish I had heard uh, about 10 years ago, and hopefully it'll be helpful for you. So a year ago, I came out with a new book, Running Down a Dream. And it was one of those really just stupid things that I shouldn't have done. If you looked at my career, I had two books about book marketing. I built an entire brand around book marketing. I spoke on book marketing. I'd been doing it for a decade, um, worked with a lot of big name authors. Um, if you Google me, you will find book marketing. And yet, I wrote this book called Running Down a Dream that has nothing to do with book marketing. And I convinced myself when I started that it was just gonna be this like really quick project. I kinda had it all in my head and I've written two books before. I'll knock this thing out in two months, ship it out into the world and I can go back to like my real work. And, um, you know, <laughs> if I ever actually knew how hard and long everything takes, I would never start anything. So, uh, but I did finish the draft. I finished the draft in two months and I sent it to my friend Jeff Goins, who's here today. And he sent it back to me and said, this is a great collection of blog posts, but this isn't a book. And I was like, well, let's get a second opinion. So my editor is Sean Coyne, who has been an editor for over 25 years, worked with a lot of amazing authors, including Stephen Pressfield. He's business partners with Stephen Pressfield and edited all his books. So I sent it to him. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get uh, his opinion on this. Well, he not only agreed with Jeff, he said, this is a book that people will stop halfway through, put it on their bookshelf, and completely and immediately forget they ever read it. <laughs> Not really what I'm going for, you know? <laughs> and so that began a two-year process of banging my head against this manuscript, trying to figure out what I was trying to write. I threw away two entire drafts start to finish, um, rewrote, different chapters and introductions and final thoughts over dozens of times. And each time I would send it to Sean and he would send it back with a couple notes and say, not good enough, try again. And so I'd rework it, rework it, send it back to Sean, few notes, not good enough, try again. And this went on for two years. Until one day we were having a talk about this goddamn book and <laughs> We were going over the introduction, and I had rewritten the introduction, and I was telling this story about how I had quit my job and went off on my own and started a business. And we were talking about it, and it just, I knew it wasn't working. You know, you know when it's not working. And um, we kept talking, and then I kind of jumped ahead six months in the story to six months after I quit my job. And I had failed, and I had lost lots of money, and had to call my parents so that they could send me a check so I wouldn't miss a mortgage payment. Oh, and my wife wasn't working, and my son was like eight months old at the time. And I found myself upstairs crying in the bathroom alone, wondering why I did any of this. And Sean started to laugh, as he does. And he said, I think you found your book. And I had. Two months later, I sent him the manuscript that became the actual printed running down a dream. And since the book's come out, I've been thinking a lot about this process of why we do this to ourselves. 
Like, why set out on these journeys? Why write these books? Why go on these stupid journeys? Because this isn't the only stupid thing I've done. I've mentioned one, the book. I mentioned two, quitting my job when my son was two months old and my wife you know, uh, wasn't working. And uh, I thought that would be a good time to try this thing. Um, I worked really hard to build a consulting firm. And when it finally like, smoothed out and started working, I exited and decided to start something new. Um, and yet I kept like, I keep doing these things. And so it's like, why do we do these things? And then when I'm looking at writing this book, I start thinking like, why was this so hard? Like it only took me two months, like stringing the words together is not the hard part. Like why was it so hard to figure out what I was trying to say? And I think it comes down to the fact that I was trying to tell the truth. And not the truth like one plus one is two or trying to get one my boys to fess up to who left the dishes out again. Um, this is like a truth that we all kind of know what I'm saying, but it's hard to put into words. And so as I thought about it, the phrase that kept coming to mind was, um, I'm trying to say out loud the thing that my soul is silently screaming. So my soul knows what I'm saying, or what I'm supposed to be saying. It knows, it's screaming at me, but I can't get it out. And luckily I had friends like Jeff and Sean who would not let me settle until I finally was saying it out loud. Which then got me thinking about the next question is why is that so hard? And of course the answer is because it's scary. It's really scary to put this stuff out in the world. But it's not like, if you think about it logically, there's nothing scary here. There is no tiger chasing me. There is no masked man with a knife trying to stab me. There is, you know, nobody's going to drag me to jail for anything that I'm doing, and yet I'm still terrified. And I've felt this before. Like I said, I've written two books before. Um, and, but the way that I kind of dealt with the fear then is I decided I was going to be the best. I was going to be perfect. I was going to go out, I was going to work my ass off, and I was going to learn book marketing, and I was going to work with amazing writers, and I was going to do it, and I was going to be so successful that nobody could argue with me. So when I put it in a book form, if you didn't like it, you just didn't understand it, because I obviously know what I'm talking about. And this was the way I'm trying to overcome the fear. And those first two books were these kind of like guru on a hill type books, which are great. You know, we've all read them, and they've been helpful, but it's this idea of like, I'm this really smart guy, I've done all this work, and I'm now going to bless you by giving you my knowledge and wisdom. <laughs> and what I realized with running down a dream is I had to crawl down off that mountain and go and tour the ruins of my life and go back through all of these things that I had like shoved in a box, locked it up, and put it under my bed, and done my best, not to only not think about them, but make sure nobody ever knew. And I had to open that box, and I had to tell the truth. And again, this is really scary. And the more that I thought about this fear, and I thought about what this is like stepping out into these creative journeys, whether you're starting a business, whether you're trying to write, whether you're trying to paint, um, the picture that came to me was of this idea of like getting dropped into a forest in the middle of the night and it's pitch black and you have nothing. And you're just kind of stumbling around, running into stuff, tripping, falling, nothing seems to be working. And somehow by the grace of God, you come across two dry sticks and you just start rubbing them together. And eventually a little spark comes up and a little flame starts. And it's not really helping you yet, right? You're still cold, you're still lost, you can't see anything, but you're huddled around that flame and you're like desperately feeding it, thinking, please stay going, please stay going. And you keep feeding it, you keep feeding it, and eventually you build this campfire. And it's raging and it's great. It's warm, you're finally safe, it's creating this nice big halo of light that's keeping all those monsters and dangerous animals at bay. And every once in a while you look over into the darkness and it's like the cartoons when you're a kid, you see the like eyes blinking, you know? But you're like, Those, I'm safe now. I've worked really hard. I've created this campfire. I'm now safe. I can continue to feed it. 
and I'm going to be okay now because of all my hard work. But then, somewhere along the way, you start kind of glancing over your shoulder into that darkness, wondering if maybe there's something else out there for you, wondering if maybe there's another adventure to be had. And you think back to that time when you got dropped into the forest, and you think, it wasn't that bad. It was a little scary. There was some hard stuff, but maybe I could do it. And this brings me to my story about Nathan Berry. So this is a story I've never told before, and a story I did not ask permission to tell. <laughs> so if you can't find me tomorrow, that's because I was asked to leave. Um, so uh, several years ago, uh, Nathan, uh, I had known Nathan, we had met at another conference, and we had become buddies, and he had this really successful teaching business, and he was teaching design and business, and uh, it was really successful, and it was growing really well. And then somewhere along the way, he started this little like extra thing, this little convert kit thing. And me and all his buddies were like, oh, well, that's cute. He started this software, but you know, this is his business. And then he started talking about closing down the teaching business, taking all that money and investing it into convert kit. And we were like, at least I was, have you heard of MailChimp? Like, <laughs> this already exists. Don't do this. And um, I know I wasn't the only one. Other, others of his friends were saying, you're fucking crazy. And uh, in fact, uh, I'm probably going to like butcher this because this is a story he told me years and years ago. But I remember something about like a mastermind he went to where like one of the exercises was everybody talked about Nathan as if he wasn't in the room but he had to sit there and listen to it and he couldn't like say anything. And all they did was talk about how he was fucking crazy for giving up, his, <laughs> giving up this successful business and then taking all that money and putting it into ConvertKitten. Has he heard of MailChimp? There's other ones. There's like AWeber, there's like other ones out there. And, um, but he did it anyway. And uh, this was right about the time that I had exited out of my consulting firm and I wasn't really sure what was next for me either. And uh, we were at a conference together. And uh, it, it, the room had cleared, and it was at night. And we were sitting there, and we were kind of talking. And we were both basically saying, I really hope this works. And uh, I was thinking, you know, mine might. Yours is definitely not. <laughs> um, so obviously, I was wrong. Um, but if you dropped me back into that moment, I would have said the same thing because at, from the outside, it looked crazy. But Nathan knew something. He had built this fire, and he was warm, and he was safe, and he could stay by that fire for a really long time and be just fine. But he had started looking over his shoulder, thinking, maybe there's something else for me out there. Which then brings me back to my original question. Why do we do this to ourselves? Because we can talk about we want freedom, and we can talk about money, and we can talk about being successful, and we can talk about putting our art into the world, and we want to help people. But I start kind of thinking beyond that, because when it gets really, really, really hard, not just two reallys, but like three reallys hard, like, those things kind of go out the door, because I can find a decent job that'll give me like maybe some good vacation. I had a buddy get a job that gives them unlimited vacation. That's freedom, and I can make money. So why do this thing to ourselves? Why keep looking into the darkness? Because the fear never goes away. Like I've worked with the people that have found the success, and they are more afraid after the success. If you've ever seen that TED Talk by Elizabeth Gilbert, where she talks about writing the book after Eat, Pray, Love, and how even the thought of that makes her want to start drinking gin at 10 in the morning. And I get that. I try not to, but I understand. And so when I come back to this question of like, I need, I need a bigger reason. Why are we doing this to ourselves? Because, you know, my kids know me. Hopefully I'll be around for my grandkids probably be gone by you know, the time the next generation. But you know, fast forward five, four, five, six generations. Like, can you name those people in your family tree? Like, 
we're going to be gone, and nobody will care how much money I made, how much freedom I had, any of that stuff. That'll be gone. So why am I doing this? And so the answer came to me kind of a weird way. I was listening to the Joe Rogan podcast because I'm a middle-aged man who watches too much UFC. And uh, he had Chuck Pelagnuk on that had written Fight Club, that's wrote Fight Club and a bunch of other books. And if, you, if you've ever like dove into Chuck's writing, it can be kind of dark and kind of hard to read and a little like way over the edge and like all this kind of stuff. And when I, when I think about artists like this, I'm always like, what are they doing here? Like, are they just trying to put it in your face? Are they just trying to like get a reaction and provoke a reaction and, and be that person that's like pushing the edge? And then he told this story. And he talked about how he was doing an event and he did a reading from one of his books that was like this really hor like horrifically embarrassing sexual experience. And uh, he told this story from stage. And afterwards, this woman came up to him that was in her 40s, and she told him this story about how when she was six, her mother beat her and shamed her and called her a whore when she was six, and how she had carried that story with her, and she had never told that story to anybody, but it had affected her, of course, in so many different ways for 40 years. And she told Chuck, if you can tell your story, then maybe I can tell my story. And if I tell my story enough, maybe I'll be OK. And I understood, this is what we're trying to do. It's not just about me. It's about the more that I step into my darkness, it gives other people the opportunity and permission to step into their darkness. Because I think there's two ways that you can view the world. You can look around, you can watch the news, you can see the poverty, you can worry about global warming, you can see Trump, and you can hear about a couple dozen white dudes in Alabama taking rights away from women, and you can start to think that maybe we're just polishing the brass on the Titanic. Like, this fucker's going down. Let's just you know, try to make it a little nicer on the way down. Or you can look at it a different way. And you can look at things like uh, poverty is at the lowest it's ever been, ever. You can look at the fact that infant mortality is the lowest it's ever been. You can look at the fact that violence, if you look over a long enough time period, it's at the lowest it's ever been. We no longer crowd into coliseums and watch slaves get eaten by lions for fun, right? Things are getting better. And if you look at a long enough chain and you see this, I believe that we're moving towards something amazing. We're moving to, you can call it enlightenment, you can talk, call it heaven on earth, you know, whatever you need to call it. That's where we're going. And we've been on that road for a very, very long time. And the road is stretching out far in front of us, so far that nobody in this room is going to get to experience it. But... We're a part of it. And so when we do our work, we're a part of this long chain. And we're pushing that just a little bit further towards enlightenment and heaven and whatever is to come that's going to be amazing. And it's our job to do our work, to step to the edge, step into the darkness so that other people can, so that someday we'll reach that together. Thank you.